Now my topic is imaging in CSR, AMD, then uh, IPFT, and uh, other medical retina problems. But there are other medical retina problems, but I don't think I will be able to cover because there's only 10 minutes. And regarding the rest of that, what I plan to do is that I will just uh, share with you a few of uh, the cases that uh, we have seen and a few from the literature also in which the imaging modality has helped us to arrive at the diagnosis and plan the management. And begin with a typical, very simple case. You know, this is the history and this is the geography. Uh, there is no confusion here. This is a central serous courier retinopathy. The first attack, so initially maybe uh, it is even allowable to treat this patient without any further imaging. But however, having now, OCT is a basic imaging that we should be doing now and that will show us the fluid here and it will categorically confirm the diagnosis and it will help us to prognosticate the case and also follow up the patient uh, during his management depending upon how the fluid goes and all those things. But this has got, this patient is actually uh, already one month after onset, he is a techie, he is anxious to get back to work and so some form of a management has to be done. So this brings us to the question, what imaging has to be done if you want to plan management? Obviously, a fluorescent angiography. And it shows us the typical smoke stack appearance. It also tells us that this is a treatable lesion because you can see that the leak is uh, well away from the fovea. And so we treated this patient with a, a focal photofomentation, that is subthreshold laser, and this patient improved to 66, and he could go back to work. Now, this is the type of CSR that uh, uh, we retinal specialists generally don't want to see actually, which we would like to refer to somebody else because it is very hard to treat this. This indicates the CRP, it is very well evident in the fluorescent angiography where all those leaks are seen, the, the, the gravitational tracks and the multiple leaks. So, if you are planning a management in this case, we would like to know what exactly is going on here in the choroid level also. A multimodal imaging comprising of all these things would be very useful here and which is available with the spectralis. This is a case from the literature and you can see that this is the fundus autofluorescence which shows up the gravitational tracks very well as the hyperfluorescent areas. The fluorescent angiography brings out the leaks and also the gravitational tracks as window defects. The ICG gives us much more information here. You can see that there is a lot of dilated choroidal vessels here and the hyperpermeability. And the spectral domain OCT, it brings, it shows us there is a hyperreflective flow within the subretinal fluid, which is indicative of fibrin. And underlying the enhanced depth imaging also brings us the dilated choroidal vessels, which you can show beneath the site, which is corresponding to the leak, which actually is an evidence that the choroidal vessels is very well involved in the pathology here. So obviously, you will be drink, thinking about doing a PDT for this case, a photodynamic therapy. And other OCT findings, uh, which has recently come into the fore with the enhanced depth imaging in the CSR are all these things, especially the dilated choroidal vessels and this beautiful imaging of the fibrin this, uh, the dipping of the retina into this, which is known as the retinal dipping. So all these things are, uh, uh, can be seen with the enhanced depth imaging now. Now, this is a case, again from the literature, the fluorescent angiography shows the leak here, and again of a CSR, and the ICG brings out the dilated coral vessels, and the leak in the late phase. Now, a half-fluent PDT was done for this case, and you can see that there is a marked decrease in the caliber of the coronal vessels and the leak has sort of disappeared. So the PDT also helps us to actually uh, uh, bring, bring, actually demonstrate the effect of the treatment, effect of the PDT treatment very well. So that is the importance of PD, I mean, ICG also in some of these cases of chronic CSR. Now, this is a 50-year-old female with a diabetes of 6 years and the fundus was actually dilated for a routine diabetic retinopathy screening and uh, since uh, the resident he was looking for diabetic retinopathy, he found diabetic retinopathy in all these things, thought that this is a heart X-ray and diagnosed this as a mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. But uh, these are 
anyway not hard i fear it's not very hard for the practice guys but if at all there's an any doubt you can always look at the oct and it will beautifully demonstrate the the drusen as this undulations and elevations of the hyperreflective band beneath the rp with the less reflective material beneath them and the inner retinal layers are intact so this is enough for diagnosis and management of this case so this is a case of a dry rmd vision is 6 by 6 you don't need to do much you just need to follow up the patient but uh, being an uh, uh, tertiary care you'd always like to have a baseline fluorescent angiography and that is what we did uh, that we did and uh, you know it has lighted up like a christmas tree and this time the resident was more happy because he thought these are all microenzymes again but evidently these are not as you can see these are a pinpoint and without any fuzzy hyperfluorescence that is associated with microenzymes these are all the drusens you can see a large number of them much more than you can see here has appeared here and these are also present nasal to the disc and also elsewhere this is a case of a familial dominant drusen and this case also need to be followed up during follow up what you need to do is serial oct perhaps for because these are our high risk drusens can develop cnvm later now this is also a case of a dry amd and with it's an advanced amd because of this geographic atrophy that is involving the center or the foveal area that you're seeing here and this is more advanced and the corresponding oct you can see that the choroid is image much more easier because the light beam now penetrates uh much more deeper and this sort of an uh, this is not as a reverse shadowing because of the an effect due to the increased penetration of the lesser eye there and uh, here also there is no need for further imaging you can just treat the patient and follow up the patient but if you do an ffa this is what you will be finding out there will be an area of window defect and the large choroidal vessels can also be imaged very well inside that and there's a value of an autofluorescence in some of this case of geographic atrophy because it uh, actually uh, tells us Uh, brings the area of atrophy very clearly at the hyperfluorescent area but rather than the hyperfluorescent area what is outside this is of more importance when you want to prognosticate this case because these areas of small hyperfluorescence that you see i can see around the hyperfluorescent area is actually an indication that further atrophy is going to be happening here and so you can actually uh, look for that now this is with the this sort of a fundus picture along with this oct there is no doubt in the diagnosis uh, you can see the cnvm here which is above the retinal pigment epithelium which shows that this is a type 2 cnvm or a classic cnvm and you can see the subretinal fluid on either side which tells you that this is active and so this needs to be treated this is a wet amd type 2 cnvm this needs to be treated so you can just start injecting anti vgf is there any need for an ffa or an icg here now this doesn't actually tells us whether it's a juxtafoveal or a subfoveal cnvm very clearly or categorically but that you may argue that that is not needed actually because anyway we are going to inject anti vgf but however it is better at least in my practice i will always uh, do an ffa and this is what you find out it confirms the typical findings that you get in an ffa of a classic membrane where you get the early lazy cartwheel appearance and the later uh, hyper hyperfluorescence where the cartwheel appearance is not cannot be uh, delineated further because of the hyperfluorescence so now you know you know that this is the juxtafoveal cnvm now this case again this typical appearance of the membrane and the oct tells you that this time the membrane is actually beneath the retinal pigment epithelium this is a fibrovascular pd and there is a type 1 cnvm or the occult cnvm and uh, the srf shows activity this case also you can actually treat uh, without further imaging but it's always uh, you know it's better to have a baseline ffa and the typical patterns of an occult cnvm in an ffa it's all well known so you can just take an you know, ffa for confirm confirmation you can see that uh, it shows that the area of stippled hyperfluorescence it starts in the early phase and the late phase you can see that's a leakage which is not as intense as in the classic cnvm and icg 
tells you the actually demonstrate the occult CNVM or the sub RP network. Now, here this is another case which shows you the other pattern of the occult CNVM where there is no leak in the early phase, but late picture shows a few areas of leak, which is always said to have the late leakage of undeterminate origin. And the OCT demonstrates the CNVM. But this sort of a case with this fundus picture with a lot of hemorrhage and all, you need to exclude something like a polyps or IPCV. And that is why it is uh, better. I would be always doing something like an ICG in this case. And this was the ICG. What you can see here is the hotspot. It confirms the occult CNVM. And so you can treat it. Now, as far as the monitoring of the treatment, monitoring of the therapy that you give to a coral neovascular membrane or a wet AMD is concerned, the serial OCT is very, very important and it actually tells you when to repeat your injections and when to stop your injections. Now, this is another case, uh, the 45-year-old man which is who was actually referred as ENVM and the other is within normal limits. You see this lesion here. And the OCT was taken, it demonstrates that there is a hyperreflectivity here. So again, an intra-retinal neovascular complex because it is above the RPE. And there is signs of activity as you can see by the SRF here. There is some amount of cystic space beginning to form here. So considering the age of the patient and considering the location of this neovascular membrane, uh, you would be tempted to think of something like a, uh, a RAP or a retinal angiometrous proliferance and you would like to confirm that by doing an FFA. And the FFA brings out this early phase, it is hypo. And late phase, you can see this dilated retinal vessels actually forming a complex which is trying to communicate with the inner retinal uh, neovascular complex. And some of these vessels abruptly disappears. And the later phase, it is uh, replaced by a hyperfluorescence as all these things fills up. So this is the classical features that you get in a retinal angiometrous proliferance. And all these images help you to actually differentiate it from the other things like AMD and all. And these are some of the other classical findings in OCT that you get in RAP, like the cystic spaces above the neovascular membrane. There's again the neovascular membrane shows the activity. This is actually stage two where the entire retinal neovascular complex has actually started to invade into the subretinal space. Now this is another case um, uh, was with the uh, referred as a CNVM is submacular hemorrhage. We couldn't see anything, anything Beyond the hemorrhage, what we did was we inject gas and we could display the blood and following displacement of the blood with the intravital gas, this was what we saw, some orange red lesions. So immediately we thought of polyps. The OCT again shows up the typical multiple peaked PEDs here, uh, which is again suggests you have polyps. So what will be the next step or what imaging would be actually demonstrating that? FFA is not going to be much helpful. So the ICG. We could demonstrate the polyps very well, the string of pearls appearance. The other, in IPCV or the polypoil coral vasculopathy, we are all aware that the gold standard is a, an ICG. And the different types of polyp that you encounter is, the arrangement is you can have a solitary polyp, a string of pearls arrangement, or a cluster of grapes arrangements. And also you should look for this branching vascular network which can sometimes be seen. And if you have something like an video endocyne angiography, you can even demonstrate the pulsating polyps. And the SDOCD features of the uh, polyps, uh, we should be aware of, it should be a peaked PED, where you have a peak-like elevation of the RP with underlying moderate reflectivity within the peak. Uh, the height of the PED is actually more than their width, a notch in the PED, then this double line sign, or two hyperreflective lines. And if you have an enhanced depth imaging facility, then you can demonstrate this, uh, the increased coral thickening in the subsource. OCT. Another case here, the OCT shows just macular edema, but you can see there is nothing under the RPE. So this is also the age is against an age later macular degeneration. And uh, uh, so the next thing that we'll be, we will be doing is a fluorescent angiography because nothing is uh, evident here. The patient is not a diabetic or hypertensive. So this was the angiography done. So it demonstrates the telangiectatic vessels that you can see. Uh, just outside the fovea. So this is a case of uh, type 1 idiopathic gestaphobal telangiectasia or MACTEL or the aneurysmal or the exudative type of uh, telangiectasia. Now, this is another case. Now, this case may be easily, uh, you know, mistaken uh, for a, uh, in fact, has been mistaken for 
an age later macular degeneration wet amd if people mistake this as exudates or a dry amd if they mistake it as drusen but these are actually small crystals that are deposited in the superficial slightly opaque retina which is characteristic especially with this finding here you can see a venule which is actually this is one of the right angled venule which is actually dipping into retinal surface this is actually very characteristic of a uh, type 2 ijft and uh, we all we need is an oct to diagnose this condition categorically because these findings are unmistakable with this loss of retinal tissue which is resulting in this outer and inner lamella cyst and the internal limiting membrane moving in which sign is known as the internal limiting membrane drape sign so these things together there is nothing else is needed to diagnose this case of a type 2 ijft but of course the ffa will demonstrate the relenkic tears very well but it would be much subtle when compared to the type 1 and uh, in the later stage we will be seeing that mild leakage and staining now this is a late very late picture of uh, an advanced stage of a type 2 ijft where you can see some additional features of this pigments here which is actually migration of the pigment that happens along the right angle venules and that is also demonstrated here as well as in the oct along with the other findings yeah i think um, uh, i think i'll st stop here because i already exceeded the time thank you very much